I'm going to begin with a story. An elderly woman had just returned to her home from an evening at church when she was startled by an intruder. As she caught the man in the act of robbing her home and her valuables, she yelled, Stop! Acts 238. The burglar stopped dead in his tracks. Then the woman calmly called the police and explained what she had done. An officer cuffed the man to take him in, and he asked the burglar, Why did you just stand there? All the lady did was yell a scripture at you. Scripture, replied the burglar. She said she had an axe and two thirty-eights. <laughs> <laughs> she took care of that guy, that's for sure. All right, we're going to open our Bibles and get started here, and we're going to turn to the book of Genesis. The story of Jesus Christ begins even before Genesis, but here you have the first reference, I believe, to the Messiah. Genesis chapter 3. I shouldn't have to call out the page number, but if you can't find it, raise your hand and I'll do it. I don't see any hands going up. Genesis chapter 3, we have Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and here we have God speaking, and in verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between thee, that is Satan, and the woman, that was Eve, Genesis 3.15, between thy seed, that is Satan's seed, which is probably a reference to the Antichrist who will come after the rapture and be empowered by Satan, and her seed, which is a reference to Jesus Christ. And perhaps a veiled reference to the virgin birth. Because the seed is passed on through the man. But here the Bible talks about a woman having seed without a man. Probably a reference to the fact that Christ was born without a human father. And the seed of the woman is none other than Jesus. Then we have the two comings of Christ. In, it says here, it is the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head. That is the second coming of Christ when Jesus will conquer Satan and take over this earth and bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men during a thousand year earthly reign. Then it says, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel, a reference to the first coming of Christ, and I believe a veiled reference to the crucifixion. You know, the only death that we know of where the heel of the victim is bruised is crucifixion. When a person is nailed to the cross, they can exhale, but they can't inhale unless they push their body weight up on the two feet that are spiked at the bottom. And so they push up and inhale, then they slump down and exhale, and this goes on until they become exhausted. And actually, the cause of death for a person being crucified is suffocation. They can no longer push up anymore. That's why when they wanted to speed up the crucifixion, the soldiers came out and broke the legs of the two thieves. And apparently they would take something like a baseball bat and come and crack it across their knees, their legs would break, they would slump, they couldn't breathe anymore, and they would die. But when they came to Christ, he was already dead, and they did not break a bone in his body. And it says in John 19, that the scripture might be fulfilled, that not one bone in the body of the Messiah would be broken. Isn't that amazing? The scriptures are so amazingly accurate as they predict the coming of Christ. And so to push down each time on that heel, the heel becomes bruised. Isn't that amazing? The Bible foretells the crucifixion 
right here in this teeny verse that tells us about a woman having seed and that this seed would actually bruise the head of Satan and that Satan would bruise his heel. That was the first coming. The second coming, Christ comes back and bruises the head of Satan as Satan is taken down as the Antichrist <clears throat> is taken and Satan is bound up for the thousand years and then ultimately cast into hell. Chapter 4 of Genesis, Adam and Eve. Eve conceived, it says in verse 1, Adam knew his wife, speaking of a sexual knowledge, and she conceived. And bare Cain, and notice Eve was waiting for the Messiah to be born. She says about Cain, I have gotten a man from the Lord. But if you note in the margin, if you have a Schofield, it should read, I have gotten a man, even Jehovah or Yahweh. She thought her firstborn child was the Messiah. Of course, she was mistaken, wasn't she? And we find that Cain, of course, killed Abel, and then God replaced Abel with Seth, and the lineage of Christ begins. And when you read about the lineage of Christ, you can see how it begins right here in Genesis with Adam and then Seth, and you can follow on down. But there is an attack upon the line of Christ from the very get-go. Satan was tipped off as to how he would be defeated one day by Jesus Christ. And so he tries with all he can do to prevent this child from coming into the world. And so when a Abel was there as the candidate through whom the Messiah would come, Cain was uh, persuaded by Satan to kill his brother to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world. It tells us in 1 John 3.15 that Satan was of that wicked one. And uh, he obviously paid attention to what Satan had to say and killed his own brother. But we find as we go down through time, there was constantly Satan's attempt to prevent this child from ever being born. We don't want to go to all of them, but I believe the flood in Genesis 6 was an attempt by Satan to corrupt the whole earth so that this promise could not be fulfilled. We find again that the Tower of Babel, that is what took place. Then God, of course, picked out a man named Abraham to be the one through whom the Messiah would come. And we find that apparently Satan prevented Sarah from being able to have children. And here they go beyond the age of childbearing. But God miraculously intervenes and Sarah has a child when she's over 90 and Abraham was 100 years of age. And God said, your wife Sarah will conceive and bear a son. Isaac then was the one in the line. And we find that Isaac marries a wife, Rebecca, and she's unable to conceive. And notice it's again probably Satan trying to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world. And we note that Isaac prays and God intervenes so that she can have a child. Turn, if you will, to chapter 25 of Genesis. It says here in verse 21 of Genesis 25, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So Sarah couldn't bear a child. And now Isaac, her son's wife, couldn't bear children. And it says, And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And notice there were two in her womb, twins, Jacob and Esau. And God tells us which one, Jacob, would be the one through whom the Messiah would come. As you read the genealogies in the New Testament, it begins with Adam, of course, and then later with Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. And then we have Jacob having uh, 12 sons, and one of his sons has 
an illegitimate child. That child was Perez. And according to the Bible, that put a blot on the line of Christ for 10 generations. And we find, according to Deuteronomy, that that blot would be there for 10 generations. And so God goes silent about the line of Christ until those 10 generations were up. Let's go over to the little book of Ruth. I wish we had a whole year just to study the genealogies, but we don't. But here you have an abbreviation of what took place. And we'll turn to the little teeny book of Ruth. And my pages are sticking together, so if I ever find it, I'll give you the page number. It's only four uh, chapters long. It's on page 318. In the book of Ruth, <clears throat> it gives us the genealogy here that is the genealogy of Christ. And it picks up in verse 18 with Perez. Now, the genealogy is Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. God said it would be through Judah that Jesus would come. In Revelation 5, 5, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ came out of the tribe of Judah. Judah had an illegitimate child. <clears throat> it says in verse 18 of Ruth chapter 4, Now these are the generations of Perez. He was the illegitimate child, and God goes silent on the lineage of Christ for ten generations. If you have your pen, you could mark Perez number one. He, be, he begat Hezron. If you're expecting and you're going to have a child, here's a list of some great names. Hezron is number two. Verse 19, Hezron begat Ram. He's number three. Ram begat Aminadab, it's number four. Verse 20, Aminadab begat Nashon, he's number five. Nashon begat Salmon, number six. Salmon begat Boaz, number seven. Boaz begat Obed, number eight. Obed begat Jesse, he's number nine. And Jesse begat what? David. All of a sudden, God now talks about the Messiah again and tells us that the Messiah would come of the line of David. There was an attack upon the lineage of Christ. And so here we now have David. And of course God said that the Messiah would one day sit upon the throne of David. And by the way, Mary and Joseph both were related back to David. In Matthew's Gospel, let's turn there for just a moment, in chapter 1, you have the genealogy of Christ on Joseph's side. In Luke chapter 3, you have the genealogy of Christ on Mary's side. Some have imagined a contradiction because they obviously are different, but they simply haven't read very carefully. You have the genealogy split at King David. Notice, if you will, in the genealogy here, let's begin where it says in verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. These are two important persons in the past. Abraham, the beginning of the nation of Israel, that Christ would come and be king over that nation. Secondly, he would be the son of David, who was king of Israel, and Christ would sit upon the throne of David actually inheriting the throne from David's lineage. Then it begins, as we just had recounted a moment ago, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah and his brothers, 11 brothers, and Judas begat Perez, remember him? He was the illegitimate child. And then you can count 10 again here if you want here, but then we find in verse 6, Jesse begat David, he was the 10th generation from that illegitimate child. And then it says, David the king begat Solomon. 
And so Solomon is of the kingly line. Now, what is interesting is you follow this on down. We have so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. We get down to verse 16. It says, Jacob, not the Jacob we read about earlier, but Jacob begat Joseph. And then if we were to follow this pattern, it should read, and Joseph begat Jesus. But it doesn't. Because Jesus was virgin born and Joseph was not the father of Jesus. And so it says here, Jacob begat Joseph. And then it says, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So Joseph's role was he was the husband of Mary. He could pass the heirship to the throne of David on to Jesus, but was not his natural biological father. As Jesus Christ was actually begotten by God himself. By the way, Joseph, when he learned that Mary was pregnant and he knew that he was not the father, he was troubled. Look at what it says in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Obviously people knew that she was pregnant. When as uh, his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, the Bible says, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being the father. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, he could have had her stoned, but he was minded to put her away privately. That means divorce. He was going to divorce Mary. Did you know that? Joseph was ready to divorce Mary, let it be a quiet thing, and he was going to put her away, is the phrase. But while he thought on these things, and Joseph obviously was doing a lot of serious thinking here, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, notice he was of the lineage of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord informs him, you don't have to worry. You can take Mary to be your wife. This child was impregnated by God the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son. Now that's before sonograms. <laughs> Everybody knows now what sex you have before they're born. But God had them all beat out. And he told them right up front that she was going to have a male child. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. From the Hebrew it's Yeshua, which actually means he is God who would bring salvation. Notice the next phrase says, for or because he shall save his people from their sins. So here came the Savior, Yeshua, or in English, Jesus, the male child born of Mary. Now look at verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, and here's one of many, 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 many prophecies that were fulfilled when Christ came. He fulfilled all of them. And the quote is, Behold, verse 23, a virgin shall be with child. From Isaiah chapter 7, told 740 years before Christ ever came, and she shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus, one of his names is Emmanuel. It means God dwelling with you. And we find here that that was all in fulfillment of what had been prophesied. So Jesus Christ is God who took on human flesh. Then Joseph, being raised from the dead, rather from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth, forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. He did what the angel had said. What is interesting in verse 25, it talks about how that he knew her later and they had children. Did you know that Mary and Joseph had at least six children? How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us so. Turn, if you will, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. Matthew, the next book to your right is Mark. And here it tells us about Jesus in this is page 1052. Christ 
worked with his father in Nazareth in a carpenter shop. And they said about Christ, is not this the carpenter? Is not this the carpenter? He's the son of Mary, the brother of, and look at the brothers that are mentioned here, which are the half-brothers of Christ, that are the natural children of Joseph and Mary, the brother of James, and of Joseph, and of Judah, and of Simon. So there are four brothers, named by name here. And then it says, and are not his sisters here with us? That means he had at least two six sisters, four brothers, two sisters, could have had three sisters, four sisters, and so on. So a minimum of six natural children born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus had been born. Interesting to know, isn't it? Now, of course, in order to explain away the sinlessness of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church has come up with what is called the Immaculate Conception. It has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. It says that Mary was born without sin. She was immaculately conceived without sin. And they said because she was without sin, that's why Jesus was without sin. But that's not true, because Mary was a sinner, and she confesses her need of a Savior. I won't have you turn there, but Luke one forty seven, Mary says, My God doth rejoice in God, my Savior. She was talking about that baby in her womb that would become her Savior as well as the Savior of the whole human race. And so Mary was a sinner, as everyone in the human race has sinned. The Bible says for all have sinned, including Mary. And that doesn't explain the sinlessness of Christ. That just pushes it back a generation. But Jesus Christ was sinless, we believe, because God was the Father. And uh, the sin nature is passed on through the man. God had planned that way back in before the foundations of the earth. And we just read that the seed of the woman would defeat Satan. And that, I believe, is a veiled reference to the virgin birth. Well, we find that there are some other attacks upon the lineage of Christ. We find that one of the kings of the kingly line was a very wicked king. Turn, if you will, to Jeremiah. And this will be Jeremiah chapter 32. We have a wicked king in the lineage of Christ. It's Jeremiah 22. I was 10 chapters off. That was my first mistake. Page 795. Here we go. We find God was very upset with this man called Jeconiah, or short Coniah. It says here in verse 29, God obviously wanted to holler this loud and clear. He says, Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> this is a message for the world to hear. Verse 30, thus saith the Lord, write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David, ruling any more in Judah. Well, that was the end of the kings of Israel. God here said nobody from this man's lineage would sit upon the throne of David. This guy, when Jeremiah brought him a copy of the scriptures, he got out his knife and he just sliced it up, cut up the word of God. God got very, very angry. He says, I'm placing a curse on this guy. And nobody He's not going to prosper, and nobody of his lineage will ever sit upon the throne of David, ruling over Israel. Well, that looked like it presented an impossibility, because then how could Christ ever rule over Israel? It was promised that he would sit upon the throne of David. And the answer is the virgin birth, because the curse was not passed on through the line of Solomon from Joseph to Jesus, because Joseph wasn't the biological father. But it's interesting, the other four boys that Mary and Joseph had, natural children, 
had that curse upon him. So here are five boys in the family of Joseph and Mary. Only Jesus could qualify to be the Messiah. Why? Because brother number one, brother number two, brother number three, brother number four, all had the curse of Coniah upon them. Scratch them off the list. They could never sit upon the throne of David ruling over Israel. Also, they could not have been the Savior because they had the sinful nature of Adam passed on by Joseph to them. But Jesus was sinless because the sin nature passed through the man was not passed to him. It looked like an impossibility here, but God circumvented that again through the virgin birth and the curse was not upon him. Yet Christ had to be of the lineage of David. Look, if you will, at Luke chapter 3. And here we have the genealogy of Christ. And look very carefully here and you'll see that this genealogy is the same up until David. But look, if you will, in verse uh, 32. This reads backward, or the genealogy goes the opposite direction. Verse 32 says, which was the son of Jesse. Remember, he was the father of David. Back up in verse 31 now. His son was David. Going up in verse 31 in Luke 3, his son was what? Not Solomon, but Nathan. <coughs> so Nathan was the line from David to Mary. And so of the flesh, Jesus was related back to David through Nathan, but the kingship to sit upon the throne of David was passed on by Joseph, but the curse was averted because he was not the natural father, and the curse of Coniah did not come upon Jesus Christ. I think it's absolutely fascinating how the scriptures work out. This is complicated when you think about it. And it looked like it was an impossibility. How could Jesus ever fulfill the prophecies which looked like there were roadblocks to make it impossible? He had to be the seed of the woman. The virgin birth only could explain that. He had to be of the line of Solomon but couldn't have the curse of Coniah. And the virgin birth solve that one, and so on. And so Jesus Christ is able to fulfill the prophecy. Let's go to Luke now, chapter 1. What did the angel tell Mary when he saw her? It says in verse 26, and in the sixth month that was of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. That's where Mary and Joseph lived to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. Notice what it says here, of the house of David. Joseph was of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. A little sidebar here. Some people talk about speaking in tongues today, which has ceased. There is nobody that speaks in the biblical gift of tongues, which is a known foreign language without training, to excuse the babble that they do, the gibberish that they do, many will say that they speak in an angelic tongue. So we're not talking English, Spanish, French, German. We're talking an angelic term. I believe that means they speak eloquently. Notice, and you'll never find an example, the angel, when he spoke to Mary, didn't say, <laughs> and Mary, Mary said, what is he saying? <laughs> My God. Angels are excellent communicators, and when the angel spoke here to Mary, you'll notice here, she clearly understood him. So if you speak in a tongue like an angel, you're going to speak eloquently. You're going to be a masterful communicator. Everybody will understand what you're saying. Notice what it says here. The angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. 
Blessed, thou, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And, and she cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Notice verse 32. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, what? David. And notice, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be, what? No end. He's going to reign forever and ever. Now notice, there's a conversation going on. She clearly understood this angel. And she said, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered. She understood the answer. The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. In other words, this child would be holy. This child would be sinless. This child would be begotten by the Father. You know, John 3.16, most people just go right on by it, but it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten. There was only one child ever begotten by God the Father, and that was the flesh that God took upon Himself, that Jesus indwelled, that God indwelled, and He gave Him in order to become our Savior and die on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sins and mine. And so the Bible talks about the virgin birth in John 3.16, doesn't it? Because it doesn't say that God so loved the world that he gave to the world the son of Joseph, does it? It says that he gave to the world his only begotten son. God had begotten this child that would be the Savior. If Joseph was the father, then we have to just pitch out the whole Bible because everywhere you look, it's all about this was God's son, God in flesh, that God fathered the child. Look at what you'd have to do. It would destroy the whole New Testament. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 1. Here we have Paul telling us about the gospel. Romans chapter 1, the sixth book in your New Testament, page 1191. It talks here about, in verse 1, the gospel of God. Verse 2, which God had promised beforehand, or afore, that means in advance, by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We've already seen that. Beginning in Genesis, we saw one of the amazing prophecies of the coming of, of the Savior. And then it says in verse 3, concerning Joseph's son, Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't say that. If Joseph had been the father, this would have to read concerning Joseph's son. But notice the Bible says his son. That's because God was the father. You can't escape the virgin birth. You have to pitch out the whole New Testament because it's implied everywhere that Jesus was God's son, the only child ever begotten of the father. God in flesh Jesus Christ. The story is so wonderful. Turn, if you will, now to 2 Corinthians. It comes right after 1 Corinthians. It's to your right from where you are right now. Page 1233. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. A favorite verse of mine. I memorized it as a new believer Look at this wonderful verse. It says, For he, referring to God, hath made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be what? Sin for us. The next phrase says, Who knew no sin. Jesus Christ was that holy thing that would come out of Mary's womb. This one that would be called the Son of the Highest. He'd be called the Son of God. And this was the child that God the Father had begotten. God made Christ, him, to be sin for us, Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in Him. Wow. God's redemptive plan revolved around a virgin-born child, a sinless human being that would be God Himself. And that 
our sins, your sins, my sins, would be taken and laid upon Jesus Christ and he would be made to be sin for you and me. So that in the exchange that would take place because of what happened at Calvary, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ traded places with us. Wow, that is incredible, isn't it? If you were to die, how many people would line up and say, I'll take your place? <laughs> Not too many, probably. You wouldn't get a long list. Maybe a family member, somebody who dearly loves you might, but uh, it's not going to happen, generally speaking. But here, God in heaven knew about you and me being condemned and going to hell. And because of his love for the world, for all of mankind, he says, I'm going to give my only begotten son. And I'm going to indwell that flesh. And I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to take your sin upon myself. And I'm going to pay for it in full. And if you'll only trust that I did that for you, I will trade or exchange with you for your sin. And I will give you my very own righteousness. What an incredible exchange. If you wanted to give away your sin, you'd have trouble getting rid of it. You could put your sins on eBay wouldn't sell. Nobody would want them. Nobody would want your sin. You couldn't even give them away. You couldn't pay somebody to take them. But yet, Jesus Christ said, I'm going to take your sin, and I'll pay for your sins in full. And better than that, he says, in exchange for your sin, I'm going to give you my righteousness. <sighs> what a win, 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 win deal that is. If I could illustrate, I'm going to take this hand of mine and let it represent all of us. The hymnal representing sin, placing it on my hand to illustrate the fact that we're all sinners. Is there anyone here today that's never told a lie? Stand up. We'd like to meet you. I am concerned. We have a house full of liars. Be careful not to believe everything you hear from everyone here. The Bible is the only book we can really trust. But we're all sinners. And according to the Bible, if you paid for one sin, even a lie, you'd go to hell. But here we are with sin. If we paid for it, it would be hell. We can't enter heaven with sin. Where there's sin, there's death. So in order to go to heaven, all of your sins have to be paid for. Your works will not pay for them. The Bible tells us that your best righteous works are filthy rags. So what we need is a savior. Letting my other hand represent Christ, I'm gonna let the clean side of this paper represent his righteousness. To enter heaven, you'd have to be as righteous as Christ. What happened at the cross was this. Our sins were taken and laid upon Christ, and he paid for them. Was buried and then came back from the dead. When you trust that he did that for you, then God exchanges and credits your account over here with his righteousness. That makes everybody that trusts Christ as Savior eligible to enter heaven because sin cannot exist in the presence of God. This is the story of Christmas. This is... God giving his only begotten son. This is God offering the gift of eternal life. I went through 18 Christmases and looked every year under the tree for the gifts that were sitting there. And it wasn't until 18 that I realized the real gift was nailed to the tree. It was Jesus himself. And if you would only trust him, you'd receive the gift that God is offering the gift of eternal life. Wow. I don't know how old you are, but whatever age you were when you trusted Christ, it was that many years that you missed the meaning of Christmas. And if you're sitting here today and you haven't received the gift of eternal life, you're not assured of going to heaven when you die, you still have missed the meaning of Christmas. 
And tragically, millions will celebrate the holiday and not have a clue that the real gift is eternal life through Christ. And that's really the best news anybody's ever going to hear. That's what you and I can share. We can tell others of this wonderful story. And if you've not trusted Christ yourself, you could receive that gift right here this morning. Wouldn't that be great? I'll tell you, my Christmases have never been the same since I was 18 and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I see it totally different. And as you notice, <clears throat> God has an amazing book here that only God could have worked this out. These were insurmountable obstacles for the prophecies to be fulfilled. There was nobody that could fix them. Only God could bring about a Savior that was sinless, that circumvented the curse of Coniah upon the line of David, that was able to pay for the sins of the whole human race by being God, able to make an infinite payment. Only Jesus Christ could meet the job description Nobody else need, need apply. No one else would qualify. Only Jesus Christ could be the Savior. I pray everybody here is saved. I used to listen years ago on the radio to Oliver Green, and I remember him saying, God, save that sinner that's closest to going to hell. I've never forgotten that. There's somebody here, maybe, that's close to going to hell. Because if you die without Christ, that's exactly where you're going to go. And every day when I get a chance to present the gospel, I think about that. That there's somebody listening. Somebody out there that's close to going to hell. They need to be saved. They need to hear the story. They need to realize that Jesus Christ has come and paid for their sin. And once you comprehend that, I don't believe Christmas will ever be the same again for you. This is the best news, the good news of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, with no one looking around. If you came in here today and didn't know whether you would go to heaven or not, chances are, are that you weren't going. Chances are you were headed straight for hell. But my friend, you can turn that around right now. You could receive the gift of Christmas. You could receive the gift of eternal life right here and right now. How do you do that? Well, you could whisper a prayer between you and the living God. You could say, God, I'm a sinner. That's just being honest. Every one of us just admitted a moment ago, telling at least a lie. We're all liars condemned, headed for hell. But continue your prayer and say, God, I believe Jesus Christ came and died and paid for my sin on the cross. I believe that by Christ's death and shed blood, He paid my sin debt in full. I believe He was buried. I believe He came back again from the dead. I believe He's alive forevermore. And I trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. As the one who died so I could live as the one who gave his life so that my sins might be forgiven. I trust him as my only hope of reaching heaven as my very own Savior. The moment you do that, God up in heaven knows and he saves you. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. We're never, never told in the Bible to look for a feeling. If you look up the word feel in the Bible, it's always used in a negative way. Never of assurance. Feelings are up and down and not, not uh, to be counted on. But you have something far better. You have His Word on it. God is not going to lie. He's not going to trick you. He's not going to change His mind. If you believe what God has said, then you can be assured of going to heaven. If God said it and you believe it, that settles it. It's that simple. Pray that prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. I trust Jesus as my Savior right now. I believe He paid for my sin by His death and shed blood, was buried and rose again from the dead. 
I trust you as my only means of reaching heaven right now. Now, if you just did that, the Lord up in heaven knows that he saves you. But I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind letting me know. I'd like to include you in my closing prayer. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. In fact, on purpose, so you'll not be put on the spot while no one is looking, I'm going to ask if you would lift your hand, not now, but in just a moment, if you trusted Christ, in a moment I'll ask you to do this. But I'm doing it while no one is looking. Nobody's looking except for me. No one will even know. But I just would like to include you in my closing prayer. I'd like to rejoice with you and pray for you. And if you prayed that prayer right here this morning to trust Christ, right now, would you lift your hand where I could see it and then put it right back down? God bless you, yes. Or the rather slip it up where I can see. It's difficult sometimes for me to see. But God sees. God bless you, sir. Yes. Anyone else? I trusted Christ right here this morning as my Savior. Lift your hand and put it down. Raising your hand doesn't save you. Joining a church doesn't save you. Nothing you could do of yourself would save you. Only God can save you through faith in Christ. And if you did that here this morning, lift your hand right now. Anybody else? I trusted Christ as my Savior. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two that by the hand of indicated they trusted you right here this morning as their Savior, receiving for the first time the gift of eternal life. We pray you'd give them assurance. Let them know it's really true. It's right there in the Bible and that you will not lie. And we pray that they might grow now in the knowledge of Christ by studying the Bible, by coming to services like this where they can learn the Bible and become equipped and trained to go out with this message to someone else, their loved ones, their family, their friends. Lord, we pray that everyone here might be challenged with bringing somebody to church, with presenting the gospel in some way to distribute the gift of eternal life by telling people through tract or CD or whatever means they can, a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation to distribute this wonderful gift of eternal life to as many as would believe or trust Christ, whosoever that would believe on Christ would not perish but have eternal life. We ask you to bless each and every one here. We ask you to bless our dinner that will follow the Christmas program with the children tonight and uh, the uh, Christmas Eve service next Sunday night at 10 p.m. as well as the morning services next Sunday. Bless uh, this church and each of its people. In Jesus' name, amen.